one day when I was walking to campus, I was like in my, my sophomore, junior year, I ran into an old friend of mine from high school and I was like, oh, yo, dude, like, how are you doing? And, and we talked and we chatted uh, and then we ended up hanging out and he's now my roommate and he's like my absolute best friend. And I, so I think, I think meeting him and seeing him again was just like a huge moment in, in learning myself because he's helped make who I am today, I think, yeah. I really appreciate him as a person and, and just the chance that I had a class starting right after he had a class ending and then we happened to walk the same uh, direction even though that was a path he didn't normally go on was like such a chance and such a good moment that in itself was so insignificant but its effect on on the past couple of years and like the development of myself has been huge because I never I don't think I would have ever reached out to him because we never we never really were like super close in high school we were just more of acquaintances and there's all these interesting existential questions you could ask is our life path formed from these instances of serendipity and does one uh, particular instance of serendipity are we destined for that or do we have multiple options and we just happen to run into that one therefore our trajectory of life takes that direction small experiences are what make up life I, I, I think to expect great things is great but I think to enjoy the small things is better you know thinking about times as we all have had many in life um, that did not go according to plan sure maybe challenges or things that just were unfair um, how do you look back on those experiences now um, do you wish you could change them with a magic wand or do they somehow formulate a uh, more meaningful trajectory for you? Um, I read this book called The Center Cannot Hold. I, I don't remember if the author's name was Erin or Ellen Sachs. I'll call her Dr. Sachs for purposes of not messing up her name. <laughs> um, but she did a TED Talk on it, and I watched the TED Talk before I read the book, and I read the book, and the book is excellent. Uh, but she is diagnosed with what her psychologists at the time called grave OC, uh, grave schizophrenia, and so she has extreme, extreme schizophrenia with extreme with with these hallucinations that like you couldn't even really think about or even perceive in a way that would make sense to someone without schizophrenia. Um, but at the end of her her TED talk, she says, "So." You may ask, if I could take a miracle pill to get rid of schizophrenia, would I? Absolutely yes. So she would. And, I, and that was a surprise to me, because you'd normally expect that answer to be like, no, like it's made me, and, and like it's who I am. Right. And, and I think she said something along the lines, lines of that, of it is who I am today. And, and, but, but she didn't get to where she was because of, because of schizophrenia. She got to where she was despite of it. And I think to that's a loud car. I think to apply that to like just general life and to say like I am not here because of those moments, but instead I'm here despite of them. I think that's like how I want to look at it. Is like yeah, all this crappy stuff has happened to me before, but I'm here despite it. I'm here. I made it through it, and I'm alive, and I like living. That's yeah. If I wanted to give myself like a good, good piece of advice, it would probably just to say, I'd probably just say to myself like, people don't care that much, but that doesn't mean that they don't care in a negative way. It just means that they don't care in a way because it doesn't necessarily affect them. And I think that's what a lot of people say about like, when I was going into college, a lot of people were like, oh, like, you know, go to class in sweatpants no one cares you know it's like that kind of idea is that like people are selfish like we're just naturally selfish and that's okay and, and uh, I think another thing so I'm giving multiple I think another thing would be that like <clears throat> um, being kind is inherently selfish because you do it to make yourself feel good you do it to make yourself feel good by making other people feel good. It is a naturally 
inherently selfish thing to do. You know, you're, you're saying like, I'm going to do this thing for this person and I feel good because of it, right? You get something out of being kind. It's an, it's an interesting question. Right? And, and I think to like, I had such an issue with like, well, being kind to people doesn't matter if I'm getting something out of it. Like I might as well just be selfish in a different way. My therapist told it to me and it was really good. I think that I'm being kind for selfish reasons. Whereas in, I think I'm being kind because I get something out of it. And she was like, what's wrong with that though? Cause you're still being kind. You're not being manipulative. You're not like trying to get people to do stuff for you. You're being kind and you feel good because you're being kind to people and that's okay. You don't need to be feel guilty about being nice to people. I think that's kind of what I was trying to say. It's like, it's like, like you can, you're allowed to take satisfaction from, from selfless activities. Like, like that's okay. you like, like, a, and that's kind of what we talked about earlier with like community is like the idea of working with a community as fulfillment. That is self fulfillment through the fulfillment of others and that's okay and you don't need to feel guilty about that you know and I, and I think that's a perfectly like reasonable and okay way to go about doing things in your life is to feel less guilt about it what brings you a sense of joy and fun or contentedness outside of societal pressures or interpersonal relational friendship pressures like what purely brings you joy in this life that you currently have I don't know, sometimes I can sit there and sort of like reflect on the idea that I'm alive and I think the fact that I'm alive brings me joy. Um, the bus. I think like, yeah, I, I would say that just living is like such an enjoyable thing to experience things as a conscious being is like such a unique experience <laughs> and there's nothing like it but to, to be a bit less like you know philosophical about it I would just say my you said outside of interpersonal relationships but I would say my, my friends I would say the people in my life make my life worth living and uh, being able to do things for them and being able to be with them and talk with them and I guess experience living together. I think that's experience, I guess, with, with people by myself is what makes me happy. That's, yeah. that's a great answer, man. Um, we can cut it there, but I would ask, I don't know if this will be recorded or not. Sure. What? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> these, these buses are so loud. What, what, do, what do we think it is that makes like this collective experience with each other more meaningful than the isolated existence in pursuit of our own, like, you know, hobbies and, you know, we, we being a, a man of the mountain and never seeing other people. It's like, because there are those people, but then there aren't very many. Most even... Well, I think to say, like... Eccentrics enjoyed. This is, this is taking your question with all of the information you provided. Sure. So I'm going to look at the last, the last part of it first. It's like the man on the mountain. The reason they do that is to live through suffering, I think, is to live without the social life, right? When you look at like, uh, like saints in, in, in Christianity, ancient Christianity, the saints that they looked at who, who took these like martyrdom, like experiences of like, there was this one guy who like lived in a cave for like 10 years or something. And he did that to suffer. I think he's choosing to suffer through isolation, which is something that is physically needed by people. And when I say physically, I mean that you are hardwired to be with people. That we are, as, as often as it's said, we are social creatures at the end of the day, and we do need a social life to feel great senses of happiness and to feel like connections you can't feel connections without people this concept of like suffering I think we talked yeah. about maybe more intelligent people choose a life of suffering I don't know why maybe that's not the case maybe just certain people choose life of suffering but why why is that is, is it the, like the vanity is it the the concept that we have to grow and adapt and that that's some sort of addic addiction we're addicted to neurogenesis or like what 
why do some people choose to suffer and others are content to have a nice tech job and do the same thing for 59 years? I think that comes down to really like the sociology of societal expectations, I guess, is like with people who work their whole lives, there's an expectation for them to do so. And I think a lot of people get really caught in that. And I, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's okay. Uh, and I think the people who suffer are doing so to separate themselves from societal expectation. The people that I've met who I've enjoyed talking to the most are usually the people who have suffered the most. Um, but they don't suffer through their own volition. You know, and and people who are forced into it are like they come out of it with a different perspective, and then that creates the idea of wanting to separate yourself from societal expectations, and they do so usually in a healthy way because they know what the unhealthy way is. Yeah, and so like mm. like the people that I've connected with the most are. Um, a lot of queer people. I've, a lot of queer people have really, really, really suffered. And I've really, like, connected a ton with a lot of my, my co-workers, my, my school peers who are queer. Because it, it's something you can't even think about if you're not queer, really. It, it's something that, like, to be put down by people because of, like, who you like or what you feel like, or who you feel like, or, you know, or maybe the absence of who you like, or whatever, you know? Hmm. Like, that's such a strange idea. And same with, like, any form of oppression, to oppress someone for beliefs, for skin color, any of that stuff. Like, that's, like, I think those people who have suffered in that way are much wiser than than those of us who haven't. I think it also comes down to like like in-group and out-group bias as well. Like perceptions of people and, and whether or not they fit in your group it depends on how you treat them. Which happens a lot in like well everywhere. It happens everywhere. It happens a lot in the US. A ton in the US. Even where we are right now it happens a shit ton. I mean, there's like like in Boulder, there's this this huge, um, there's a huge huge houses population, uh, whether it be people who are legitimately houseless or people who are choosing to be houseless uh, as nomads, and like there's this separation between the wealthy people who live like right there. They live like two streets over, and the people who live anywhere else uh, people people who are staying in parks people who are staying on the side of the road or people who are staying under abandoned buildings or anything like that it's like <laughs> the separation of human it's weird I don't like it it's funny how that <laughs> happens in a place like Boulder in a place like Jakarta in a place like India in a place like yeah. the Bay Area that's what I'm saying it happens everywhere and it sucks and, and, like, it took me talking to people to know that because I never experienced it myself. Yep. You know, like, I had to hear people's perspectives of how they've been treated to understand, even, to, to, to know what's happening. And, like, that comes again back to, like, what makes me happiest people <laughs> right? like talking to people I'm gaining my own happiness through other people's happiness or other people's experiences and yeah